In this lab, we're going to talk about the science of stability. Now, up to this point, we've looked at uh, different types of energy and how energy converts from one type into another, but we haven't really talked much about why things change in the first place and why things sometimes don't change. So, for example, um, this ball will drop and bounce thanks to gravity. That one's something that you observe in your everyday life, but there are other things that aren't so clear. Like, my body is made of mostly materials that are combustible, and we live in an environment that is full of oxygen, which is great at burning things, but I don't spontaneously burst into flames, okay? It all kind of depends on the situations that things are in and how relatively stable they are. So the science of stability is gonna help us predict when things will change and how things will change. And it'll also help us to understand why sometimes things don't change, okay? So let's start simple. So I've got this racquetball here, okay? When I hold it out, gravity is pulling down on it, okay? So as long as I am putting in the energy to keep it up here, um, I can keep it in one place, but it's being pulled on to, to go downwards, okay? So if I let go of this and I let kind of physics take the wheel, it bounces and bounces and bounces. It bounces less and less until it eventually stops and it rolls a little bit, okay? Now, as long as the ball is still moving, whether it's bouncing or rolling, it's still in the process of change, okay? And things change in order to find something that is a more comfortable situation than before, okay? So for example, I am a back sleeper through and through. Whenever I go to bed at night, I need to be on my back or else it just doesn't work. I've tried other ways, so sometimes I'll you know, force myself to be on my side because I hear that's healthier for me, you know, I snore less or something like that. Um, but once I wake up, I'm on my back. It happens every time, okay? My body kind of naturally finds the most comfortable way to sleep and will roll itself there even if I try not to be like that. Um, so any position I started, I end up on my back, okay? Other things tend to do this too, okay? The ball continues to roll because it's going from a point uh, that's higher to a point that's lower. Uh, water that flows down a hill always goes downhill instead of going back up the other direction, okay? So the ball continues to drop when I let it go because gravity is pulling it down. That's also the reason why it continues to roll for a while. It's trying to find the lowest point it can get to. The higher up it is off the ground, the more potential energy it has, the more potential it has to move. And it will convert that potential energy into kinetic energy whenever given the opportunity. Okay, so the ball will keep using its potential energy to move, you know, use kinetic energy um, until it hits a point where it's used up that kinetic energy and it's now at a more stable place. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's at the most stable place that it could be ever. Um, so, you know, this table is still off the ground. So we still have gravity pulling on the ball. And if the table wasn't here, then the ball could go down farther and become less energetic than it is here, okay? Now, right now it's not moving because we've kind of given it the best situation it has at the moment, okay? To be on a flat surface, um, to find kind of the lowest point on the table. Um, so that's about as good as it gets, okay? But if I were to move the ball just out this direction, okay? Now it has more room to drop and it can use up even more potential energy as kinetic energy. Um, some of it goes away as sound and heat as it hits the ground and as it rolls. Um, until finally the ball stops moving, okay? Whether it is bouncing, whether it is rolling, whether it is on the table or on the ground, um, it's using up that potential energy as other types of energy. It's releasing it out into the universe. And most of the time where your energy winds up is heat if you lose track of it, okay? So our, heat, our energy kind of escapes things. When something changes, okay, like in the case of this ball, we end up having things go from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. Things end up releasing or using up that energy that they have to spend on doing something, on changing, okay? And things will always use that energy to get to a more comfortable state, okay? A more simple or a, a, a more um, uh, stable, less strained, less stressed, okay? Um, you know, things take, tend to take the path of least resistance, okay? So whether the ball is on the table or on the ground or in this beaker, 
okay? It will continue to move until it gets to a stable point, and once it's as stable like as it can be in that situation, then it's good to go, it stops, okay? And this happens in other cases too, okay? Like for example, when the ball bounces, okay? It would make more sense for it to hit the ground and say, well now it's at the lowest point, this should be most stable for it, and it stops there, just, you know, boom, right there. But instead it bounces back upwards, which fights gravity. It seems to kind of go the opposite way. It's like, hey, you're using up your potential energy, it's becoming more stable, and it's going the wrong way, okay? When the ball hits the table or hits the ground, it compresses and squishes a little bit, which stores up some potential energy, some elastic energy, kind of like this rubber band stretching, okay? Where it's got to unstretch itself and go back to its original shape, okay? So that potential energy turns back into kinetic energy, which allows it to pop back up into the air a little bit. Hits the ground, the process repeats over and over, squish into potential energy, release back into kinetic, squish into potential energy, release back into kinetic, all the while losing some energy as sound and heat from friction, okay? Until eventually that energy is all released, okay? So things tend to change to get lower in energy, to release or spend, use up the extra energy that they have. Okay, and we don't really ever see it going the other way um, unless we force it to do so, unless we put the energy in to, you know, bring something up higher in the air or put in the energy to stretch something out, okay? Now, sometimes these situations can be not so obvious. So I've got this little, you know, fake ice cube you can put in drinks and stuff. Um, it's got a battery inside it and I can turn it on and I can have a light come on in it. I think I can switch it to some other color. So there's blue. And there's red again. I think there's a way I can get it to change between the colors. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, so then it's red, and then it's blue, and it's back to red, and then it's blue. Okay, so inside here is a battery. A battery is just a bundle of chemicals waiting to react and be used for electricity, which is then used for, in this case, light and some heat. Okay, so our package of chemicals, our battery here, um, is a lot like potential energy, okay? Like the gravity pulling this ball down, the potential to move, or the elastic potential energy, which is the potential to change back to its original shape, okay? Our battery is full of chemical energy, which is like potential energy of potentially being able to become something else, okay? And that new chemical should be more stable, okay? So in this case, the battery being used up to become electricity and then some light and some heat is allowing that energy to disperse. We spend and use it on something else. So we go from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, okay? That higher energy state is what we call the unstable state, okay? Um, and the um, lower energy state is what we call the more stable state, okay? So the higher energy you have, the more unstable something is. The lower energy you are, the more stable something is, okay? So not as obvious of an example. All right, so the higher energy unstable state of this ball would be being held up in the air, okay? Whereas the lower energy state would be where it's on the table or on the ground, where it's finally stopped moving, it stopped rolling, it stopped bouncing, um, where the motion has stopped, okay? For my big elastic band here, okay? My higher energy unstable states would be When I pull it out, uh, and I'm stretching it, okay, and I have to put the energy in to do that, okay, and the lower energy, more stable state is when I let it go back to its original shape, okay? I have to put energy in, and then it's released, okay, as it takes its original shape again, okay? The high energy state is what we're seeing right now for this little light up ice cube, but it's in the process of becoming the lower energy state. It's just taking a very, very long time. Um, so eventually that battery is going to run out, which means it has spent all that chemical energy as electricity, which has been turned into light and some heat. Okay. So it reached a point of higher energy of having all that energy stored up to a point of lower energy where it's used it all up and it's gone away. Okay. So the higher energy unstable state would be like where we are at now. And the lowest energy state we could get this to be in, the most stable it could be, is for that battery to have been all the way used up, okay? 
and so there's no juice left. It's, co it's totally dry. It's, it's a dead battery. Okay. Now, one more example I want to show okay, has to do with a chemical reaction. So this is a little toy popper. Okay. Now, I call it a toy, but these can still be dangerous because this uses a chemical reaction um, using a mixture of chemicals known as Armstrong's mixture. Uh, specifically, this one has um, potassium chlorate and some red phosphorus. So this combination of potassium chlorate and red phosphorus can make two new substances. One of them is a phosphorus and oxygen compound, P4O10, okay? And the other is potassium chloride, a compound of potassium and chlorine, okay? So the oxygen of the potassium chlorate gets passed over to the phosphorus, okay? And as a result, both things end up becoming more stable. So the potassium chloride and the P4O10, those two compounds are a lot more stable. They're a lot less reactive. Whereas the KClO3, the potassium chlorate, and the um, red phosphorus that I'm starting with are very reactive and very unstable. By bringing those very reactive and very unstable chemicals together, I have two high energy chemicals, okay? Now that energy can be spent and released as long as I bring them together in the right way. Okay, and they tend to work best when they have a little bit of heat or a little bit of pressure pushed on them to get that reaction to initiate. They need kind of a push, they need a kick, and that's how a lot of reactions start. Okay, and in the end, all that energy is going to be used up, released, and you'll notice and you'll see it and you'll hear it, and for me, I'll probably feel it, um, to be able to tell that we're going to a lower energy, more stable state as a result. Okay, so my higher energy state is what I've got right now. We're about to see the change that happens to get the stuff in here to a lower energy state where we have the chemicals rearrange their atoms into something that's a little bit better for them. Okay, so here we go. Let's see if I can, I can't really plug both my ears at once, so I'm just gonna go for it. Ooh. Wow. Okay, so in that moment, that release of sound and heat and maybe even a little bit of light. I, I couldn't see it because I kind of closed my eyes. Um, all that release of energy is coming from a in-the-moment chemical reaction where all that chemical energy is changed into those different types of energy and released outwards, okay? So we go from a high energy state of having these unstable chemicals to bringing them together and making some new stuff that is much more stable, okay? And these new chemicals are not really as reactive, okay? So the less reactive they are, the more stable they are, okay? And they're at a lower energy state as a result. They don't have as much energy to go and use on things. Okay, so in this lab, we're gonna be looking at some stations that all have that one common theme. We're going from high energy states to low energy states. In other words, from unstable states to stable states, okay? And we always see a change happen as we go from high energy to low energy, okay? It always happens in that direction unless we are putting energy in to cause it to go the other way. Okay. This is the squishy stress ball station. This is my squishy stress ball, and this is my other squishy stress ball. Okay. When I squish my squishy stress ball, I have to put some energy in to force the stress ball into a high energy state, an unstable state. Now, I can tell that this is high energy and unstable because I can feel it pushing back against me. Okay. This isn't like Play-Doh or clay or something where I squish that it stays deformed. It goes back to the way it was, okay? So, if I just leave this on the table and I don't do anything to it, it stays in a pretty low energy state. It's pretty comfortable, it's pretty fine the way it is, okay? It's low energy enough, it's stable, okay? If I press on it, I force it into a high energy state, an unstable state, okay? And the fact that it changes back is a sign that it's going to go to a lower energy state, that's becoming more stable. Things change to become lower energy and to become more stable. Okay. This is the fishing weight pendulum station. A okay. pendulum being something that swings back and forth and back and forth. Okay, so when I take this fishing weight and I pull it over here, all right, if I were to let go of this, it wouldn't just, you know, hang in this spot. It's going to start moving. Okay, so I have put this into a high energy state, okay, or an unstable state. Okay, and I can tell that it's high energy and unstable because it's going to go through a change when I let go of it. Okay, it starts to move. Anytime something starts to move or change, it's in the process of moving towards a more stable, lower energy state. Okay, so this is in the process of trying to stabilize. 
okay? So it's gonna use up that potential energy that I gave it as kinetic energy to swing back and forth and back and forth. It's gonna have some friction with the air, so it's eventually going to lose energy and slow down. It might even knock into the pole here and lose some more energy that way. Kind of transfer some kinetic energy there. Okay. Now at some point, it will finally stop moving, and I probably won't wait that long until it does. Okay, but you can kind of imagine where it's going to wind up at. Okay, so its lower energy stable state is going to be when this finally comes to rest. Okay, it's not going to be over here or over here or over here or you know, over there. It's going to be back in the middle where it's resting and totally down, um, you know, in kind of that lowest energy spot. This is the music box station. Okay, so I've got here a music box. So this is not electronic. This works by gears and cranks and this little drum here, okay? So what we do to use this is I crank this handle, which winds a spring on the inside of here. And when that unwinds, it turns some gears, which turns this barrel, which flicks these little combs, which you might be able to hear, make noises when they vibrate. Okay? So I'm going to wind this up, and when I let go of it, it unwinds and it starts turning the barrel, which flicks against the comb, which releases sound. So that's the sound of winding up the spring. Right. So if you can see the barrel turning, it's moving the little tongs on the comb here to make those little vibrations. You can also see the gears inside there turning. Okay. So you might think about what the high energy and low energy states are here. Okay, remember, change happens and energy is used up and released when things are going from a high energy state to a low energy state. So you might be able to tell the music's gonna start getting slower and softer, okay? Which means at some point, this spring is gonna be unwound. Hmm, hmm. So what would be the highest energy state here and what would be the lowest energy state? Okay, these are my happy and sad balls, okay? Now, one of the reasons why this guy is sad is because he's all dusty from dropping on the floor so much, but that's not the only reason. So, I'm gonna hold them out and drop them next to each other and we'll see how they, how they fare. Right, here we go. Okay, so this is the happy ball. This is the sad ball, I'm gonna do it one more time. That one barely bounces at all. Okay. Now they both start with the same amount of potential energy, okay? and they both convert that into kinetic. Okay. And as they move through the air, and as they hit the ground, and as they roll around and stuff, they're using up that energy um, as heat, okay? and friction with stuff, and with the air and with the ground, and also a little bit of sound. Okay. So they both end up releasing that energy, but it takes a lot longer for the happy ball to you know, finally calm down, come to a rest, um, stop moving. So it doesn't use up that energy as quickly, whereas the sad ball does. So in a sense, you could say that the sad ball reaches a more stable state quicker, okay? It becomes stable faster than the happy ball, okay? Which is kind of interesting. I might call it the sad ball, but it does end up being more comfortable a lot quicker than the happy ball does. So, you might think about what the highest energy and lowest energy states are for these guys and what is going to be the least stable, okay, the most unstable, which would be like the highest energy, and which would be the um, most stable, which would be like the lowest energy states. All right, this is a slinky, all right? It's basically a big spring, okay, which a lot of you have probably played with one of these at some point, okay? So, a slinky... It's a great way to demonstrate elastic potential energy, okay? 
where this can stretch out and pull itself back in, out and in and out and in and out and in. Now, kind of like a pendulum, um, when I let this go, it's finally gonna stop moving at some point. And where it's gonna stop is not gonna be fully put together. It's not gonna be fully stretched out. Instead, it's gonna be somewhere kind of in the middle, okay? It's gonna rest somewhere in between, okay? So, a slinky is a lot like a pendulum in that sense, where its most stable state, its lowest energy state, is not when it's fully stretched out, it's not when it's fully compressed, it's somewhere in between. That's where it's gonna be most relaxed and most comfortable, okay? Where it's gonna be lowest in energy, where it's gonna be most stable, okay? Now, a neat thing you can do with the slinky um, that not a lot of people know about, when you pull it out like this, if you let it drop and watch where the bottom is, okay, you might notice something kind of interesting. So I'm going to hold the slinky up like this, okay, and let it kind of settle out. So if you watch down here, I'm going to let go of the slinky in three, two, one. And the bottom kind of stays in place since it is pulling itself together this way, it's fighting gravity. So gravity pulls the top down while the bottom is pulling up towards the top. So it basically hangs and levitates in the air for a second until it all comes together, and then it can drop all together. This is the marble and a ramp station. Here's the marble, this is the ramp. I'm just gonna put the marble up on the top of the ramp there, and then let it go. I'm just kidding. As long as I don't give it any extra energy, as long as this point is no higher than that point over there, this marble will never make it off that track. Now, if I give it a push, then that's kind of cheating. I'm gonna give it some extra energy to make it over the hill. But if all I do is release it, it'll never make it across. So at some point, this is gonna stop moving. It's gonna stop changing its position. So you can probably guess where it's going to stop, right? And when it finally stops, that is gonna be its lowest energy state, its most stable state, all right? So think about that. Where is it gonna be most stable? And how's it gonna get there, okay? And in contrast, where was its highest energy state, okay? Where was it the most unstable or the least stable? Okay, what we have here is the lever weighing scale station, okay? So the way this works is we place something in this pan here, hang it from this hook here, all right? And this arm moves, okay, and it's connected to this right here. So the more something weighs, the more it's gonna push down on the pan, and the more the pan is pushed down, the more this lever arm is going to move, okay, based on how this is hooked together here, okay, and how this is hooked together here, all right? If you're dealing with something particularly heavy, you can switch this down, okay? So you've got more weight on the bottom here. Instead, you read the other scale going on here, so you can either have a scale that goes from zero to 250 grams, or a scale that goes from zero to 1,000 grams, or a kilogram. So I'm gonna flip this back up to here, okay? Should be basically sitting at about zero. Okay, so I'm just gonna drop something into the pan. All right, so it swings for a little bit and then it stops. I can add in a different ones. So if I take this out, it swings and then it stops. Place one on there, swings and it stops. I'll take that one out. So you're probably seeing the pattern here. Okay, so think about where is this at its highest energy? When is it the most unstable? Okay, and when is it the most stable? When is it at the lowest energy? It's 
throw them all in there for fun. This is the elastic popper station. I used to get these all the time as a kid at the dentist office or something like that. Okay, it's basically just a little cheap piece of rubber, okay, that you can flip inside out, okay, and that elastic potential energy wants to flip this back the other way, okay? So you can hear just from the sound of it, that is the more comfortable position for the rubber to be in. So if I try and flex it the opposite way, okay, it's gonna try and whoop, find its way back. Okay, same thing with this one here, just a different color. Okay, so I can flip it inside out and then place it on the table. And it goes popping off like that. Let's do it again. Ooh. Okay, so think about where it's at its highest energy. Okay, how it makes that change Ooh. <laughs> to become the lowest energy state that it can reach. Okay, where's it gonna be most comfortable? All right, this is the electric bell station. So what we have down here are some batteries hooked together, okay? We have a couple wires here. This one is going up to the bell, which is gonna be up here. I'm gonna point up to you in a second. The other one goes to this frayed wire here at the end, which is not connected to anything. So right now we don't have a complete circuit. We don't have any electrons or electric charges moving around through these wires. Um, so not a whole lot is happening. Um, we do have chemical energy in these batteries, which will be converted to electrical energy and then to other types of energy like sound and heat and kinetic energy once we can connect the circuit. But until then, we're stuck with all this chemical energy just waiting to be used up, okay? So up here, if we follow this wire, we have our electric bell, which is right here. Let me zoom in on it a little bit. Okay. So the other wire usually goes right here. Oops. But um, really, as long as I am touching somewhere metal, I can get it to conduct and I can get the circuit to be completed. So we change that chemical energy into electrical energy, which then gets converted into a couple other things. Okay. For example, it's converted into kinetic energy as this hammer whacks against the bell like that. It does it many times over and over very fast, okay, which causes it to um, vibrate, which releases the energy type sound. Um, and we also probably get a little bit of extra heat coming from um, you know, the friction of everything. So I can touch the actual bell part. like that. I could try and touch the arm of it, but that kind of stops it from moving. You can see it trying to vibrate. It's kind of getting in the way. You can touch right there. You can touch over here. Basically, as long as I'm hitting some point of metal where I can conduct and complete the circuit, I'm going to start using up the juice and the batteries, using up that chemical energy to turn it to electrical energy, which then converts to kinetic and uh, sound and some heat. So think about where your highest energy and lowest energy states are in this station and think about um, you know, the change that we're doing to get there. Um, especially think about the batteries, okay? As if I just kept this hooked up for a really, really long time, what would happen to the batteries eventually? Where would all that energy go? And what would that mean about the stability of this whole um, setup? Okay, this is the phosphorescent sheet station where phosphorescent is just a fancy way of saying glow in the dark. So you might be able to see that there also is already some residual glowing that's happening just from the lights being on in the room, but we're gonna add in some extra energy to get this stuff excited, um, and then you can watch the release of energy um, as we kind of go through the change from a higher energy, um, more unstable state to a lower energy, more stable state. So this here is a black light, okay? Releases violet and ultraviolet light, and if I turn it on and I run it over the sheet, it glows. Okay. If I place something in between, 
notice it only glows on places that the light can reach. So it is the light directly that is making that change. I also have a bigger light. So, what's the highest energy state? What's the lowest energy state? When is this the most stable? And when is it the most unstable? Okay, and think about what the change is going from the high energy unstable state to the low energy stable state. This is the syringe popper station or the syringe suction station. So, what I've just got here is an empty syringe. I can pull the plunger back to draw in some air and I can push on the plunger to push the air back out. Now, if I plug the end while it's empty and I try and pull back on it, it's kind of hard to do because I don't have any air to suck in, okay? So let me cover it like this. So as I pull it back, I'm making room for basically nothing, for a vacuum, and when I let go, I can feel it kind of pulling back. Okay, so think about where the stable position is as I pull this back, and when I let go, this is the balancing bird station. So here's the bird. It can balance on just about anything, so I'm going to balance it on the end of my finger here. Okay, which this seems a little odd, like. It shouldn't be balancing there, but it has some weights on the bottom of it to distribute how heavy it is at different parts of it. So you have a lot of the weight here and here, okay, which balances it across that beak point, okay? So you can actually get to balance on one of these little pyramids here. Just gonna place it right there. Sometimes you can get it to spin around without falling off, or you can get it to bob. Whoop. Got a little too hard. There you go. Okay, so that. So it seems to kind of come back to a stable place. Okay, where it stops changing. You can even get these to balance on other things like on the end of this pencil eraser. Okay, and I could kind of tip it. Whoops, too far. Let's try that again. I can tip it this way, I can tip it that way. I just can't go too far before it slips off. Okay. Also put it on the thinner end of the pencil. That looks a little bit more impressive, like that. Okay, and again, I can, if I'm gentle with it, have it spin or have it bob. Whoop! As long as I am gentle with it, I can get it to continue balancing. 